Oh, okay. All right. Um, I wanted to talk to people about what they need to do for this virus. Um, this is, I work as a bagger for Kroger, but I got a computer science degree with a minor in art. I get a trust that pays me $3,300 a month as long as I'm unthinkfully employed. And I've got a disability. It's called aphasia. It's basically an audio dyslexia. Um, I went, got a degree in computer science. It took me 10 years to get it because of aphasia and made it very difficult for me to get through all the courses. But I came out of it with a lot of um, ability is in one of those is I can deal with logic and I can make pretty good decisions and I collect lots of information off the net um, documentaries pretty much I don't read books but it's not such a bad deal because the thing about books is that um, you're taking it from an author you might have some references but uh, overall um, books can't really convey actual truth I mean you can see more actual truth in video uh, whenever they demonstrate it for you and you can see it there you can and I've had a course in what's called guerrilla video which is I know how to take things out of context and abuse context the way that Michael Moore abuses context sometimes such as in the movie Bullying for Columbine he proved that he could he tried to prove the case that he could buy a um, a, a, a shotgun the same day that he got an account at a bank and he didn't, he waited two weeks because it took two weeks to get their shotgun. But to prove the point, he edited it together in such a way that make you think they got in the same day. So Michael Moore uses those techniques and they're called Gorilla Video. I didn't take the course just to do that. I took it because I needed it as a minor uh, in art for my computer science major. Um, I wasn't good at math and I was going to be a computer animator. So I thought I should take some... Uh, take some art courses and one of them was uh, for video and I was like it was, had linear video in there and I had done non-linear video editing I was thinking I wonder what was involved in doing linear video editing is a very painful process um, it involves packing tapes and making sure the tapes um, are of a certain kind and that you um, run them forward and backward to make sure that the we that the there's enough um, tension on the reels so they can actually do video editing with them and it's what's called an AB roll system. These are things that nobody deals with anymore because they use stuff like Adobe Premiere to do their video editing. But I learned how to do that in this video course and I also learned about Gorilla Video, the manipulating of audio and video context in order to put into people's minds the wrong information by making them, by using an audio source and a video source out of context uh, with respect to each other to put ideas, make people come to different conclusions uh, than the information was actually talking about in the video. So I can look at a documentary and I can tell if they're taking things out of context and I'll just basically say, well, I don't want to watch this video because obviously they're doing the wrong stuff. However, there are some videos that I'm probably taking stuff and didn't really understand how things work. Um, when I go to the internet, I can pick up information from all sort of, sorts of places, sorts of places, and I am immune to a good number of the Christian community because I can point out stuff in their own Bible that will work against their own reasoning, such as um, the fact that God gave a sabbatical year to the Israelites. That was a year they were supposed to not work at all, and if they did, they would be any people would be stoned to death. And it was really just proving, uh, it was trying to see how much faith the people had in God. And it was also to show God's, um, the way God, how God would treat us necessarily and um, how we don't even treat ourselves that well. And so I would say probably that the sabbatical year became our Saturday and the sabbatical day became our Sunday. So if people want to go without religion, it doesn't make any logical sense to treat people nicely. That all comes possibly from the amygdala. And if we don't, um, in the prefrontal cortex lobe, if we don't use, uh, if we think that this all happened by chance, um, as Rabbi Zacharias would point out, is um, then how, why are we, why do we even have morals? Um, why are they there? Why should we treat each other nicely? Uh, where did that come from, evolutionists and um, atheists and all those guys? 
And so the thing is, is that you have to realize the Bible source has been around for quite a long time. And there's a lot of statistics that say that for something to hold up this long, there has to be something true about it, okay? Whether there, whether you think things are silly or not, there's also reasons for that as well. So I'll put it off on the side. I'm going to tell you what you need to do to survive this virus. And it's not, I'm not going to go into prayer or anything. That's that's just religion. Um, we have, what, what we know in the science community, and if you go and you look up a guy named Robert Sapolsky, He's a psychologist, and he's done human physiology, and he's done research on monkeys in Kenya and research on humans, and the kind of stress that we put on each other is equivalent to the kind of stress that they put on themselves. They spend three, three hours in the morning foraging for food. They get their food, and they spend the rest of the day giving each other social help. Okay, That's what we do to each other. It's the reason why... People who are stressed in traffic act like idiots is because their brains are not working because that's what happens when you're under stress. Another thing that happens that's not being talked about anywhere in our news is that your immune system turns off. And you're saying, well, why would that happen? Well, if you go back to Robert Sapolsky and you look to see what his research shows, um, what he says is he says basically um, the kind of stress that we're feeling our body thinks that we're going to be chased by, um, <laughs> um, comment came up, uh, the stress is going to make us, uh, the stress in our body makes us, uh, something from YouTube just popped up on my screen, and so I'm just responding to that, but the stress um, in your body makes your body feel like you're going to be chased by a lion, and the thing is, is that stress, we're only supposed to feel it um, if if there's a threat in the media at, at the current time. And the problem is, is that because of the way that all of our, the way we deal with life, that we're not like our ancestors, we didn't live on farms and we didn't grow crops, um, they didn't have this kind of stress. We have that kind of stress in the current order of things because we are afraid for our survival, for being able to keep our jobs. We're afraid, um, We've got social pressures from our friends, and we're trying to satisfy that. We got mortgages. We got um, we have to pay taxes. All these things uh, pile up, and they make us into this position that we're going to be chased by a lion um, at any moment. At least that's the way our brains are. And when you have all that stress, and you try to go to sleep, it's hard to stay asleep because you got all this stress, and it's hard to relax. The solution to that problem is pretty easy. Just find some good comedies, some Pumpkin and Kenton videos. If you have children, you interact with them over board games or card games or something. Something that they find fun and you find fun. If you're a grandparent, you call it grandchildren. Um, and, and if you have a need to be informed, don't use a news organization or YouTube because they're just going to send you um, information that's half... Uh, half um, is half eaten you know it's it's they haven't like really thought about it long enough to give it to give you the full story or actually to to say that the information they gave you was correct they're not really testing and they're putting it out there because they want to keep you watching okay and the last thing they're going to say to you is that you need to turn off the news sources turn off the internet because that's their their livelihood is to keep you watching and so they're not going to say anything about that. And the healthcare professionals should know about stress, what it does to a person. They should be talking about that. But again, the news organizations, the people on YouTube are not probably not going to tell you the truth. And the truth is, is that you need to get rid of this, this negative stress. We need to be doing positive things, things that will get our minds off this virus because your immune system is going to go off. And if you're wondering why that happens, because um, we all have bacteria in our gut. And this ba the bacteria to make ulcers is in everybody. And when you, um, when you stress, that bacteria gets out of hand because there's no immune system there to take care of it. So it basically runs rampant and it creates the ulcers. Um, so I, I didn't really cover on the reason why the immune system turns off. So go back to that. Um, your body thinks it's going to be chased by a lion, okay? 
And that's at least how the body is thinking about it. It's not you, it's the body. This is how it's responding to it. And so what it does, according to Robert Sapolsky, who's done 30 years on this, so you can look up his video. It's called uh, Stress, the Portrait of a Killer. It's also called um, The Brain Killer or something like that. But I think it's Portrait of a Killer by National Geographic. It's an hour long. It's just a little bit under an hour. And then he's got a little five-minute kind of... Um, trailer that you can watch to decide whether or not you want to watch the full hour and it's not only him it's a number of different doctors that are different researchers that have done research in what they were more interested in was doing um doing research to see um the effects of stress at different levels of of the hierarchies in in companies and in organizations and they looked at people at the bottom and people at the top and saw that people at the top really don't have really bad health care because they're not stressed it's the people at the bottom that get stressed and those are the people that are dealing with so many problems and anyhow so what happens to you is that your body thinks it's going to be chased by a lion no zebra, no antelope ever feels this. Only when they're being chased by a lion do they ever feel this. Um, the, the thing is, is your body thinks that it's going to be chased by a lion in the same way that an antelope and a zebra does. But the antelope and zebra, they don't feel it until, the, until it is a lion. But in us, our body thinks it's going to be a lion. Um, the way the body responds to the stress that you're giving it but it's really that it's not that important. And so um, what happens, what the body does, and this is what happens in zebras, zebras and antelopes and other animals, is, the, is their bodies turn off their immune system. Um, because the immune system doesn't matter if you're about to get killed by a lion. Um, high order brain functions, the ones you used to think about things, you know, clearly you know, logic and things like that don't matter because it doesn't matter where you're gonna to run to just as long as you get away quickly. Your heart rate and your blood pressure go up and, and your lung uh, takes in massive amounts of oxygen and that all comes together to fill your muscles up with warm blood that's well oxygenated so that if the lion comes after you, you can respond quickly and run somewhere super fast, okay? And you've probably seen that when, when there's a car up on um, a on a cement, if you've ever seen these videos where cars come up on the sidewalk and start running over people, the people just dart super fast. And it's because that part of their system, the adrenaline and all this stuff pops in and says, memory, uh, being able to use your mind doesn't matter. Um, immune system doesn't matter. Tissue rebuilding doesn't matter. Ovulation, all those things go offline. The thing that only matters is your basic functions to survive and you just dart somewhere fast. Um, and so you're just like, okay, well, I get stressed and then, you know, maybe it takes it off and then I'll be okay if I just like get some comedy or something and, or play some card games. But the stress is not so bad, you know, um, that's only going to cause a problem to me over a long time. No, it's wrong. My dad and I had a, uh, jail ministry in Los Alamos 12 years ago. We had a guy that came in and uh, came into our jail ministry, and we talked to him about the Word, about the Bible. And for some reason, this guy thought that because he didn't feel remorse for killing someone, that he was going to go to hell. And we tried to convince him otherwise that you, you can't go to hell for something like that. If you're repented, then you're, you're okay. But it's when you're unrepentant and you're a serial killer that's a major problem, okay? Now, the rest of the world would probably disagree with that, but the Christians need to go and check their, their check all of, talk to all their, their religious professionals, and I think they'll come back and say, yeah, that's correct. So the thing was, is we told him that he'd be okay, and he didn't believe us, and so that night he died in his sleep. He must have been in his 30s. I, I've been telling people 37. That's a guesstimation. I don't really know the age, but he was like in his 30s. Uh, he was thin. And he looked at me uh, in the face whenever he was talking about this stuff. He was really scared. And uh, we were just like, well, you know, lighten up and you'll, you'll be okay. But he would not take that. And that night he died in his sleep, 30 some odd. Um, he was thin. He must have not had any real preconditions because he looked pretty healthy. 
and uh, just stress, just stress killed the guy, okay? And it was really just a spiral that I'm gonna die tomorrow and if I die tomorrow, I'm gonna go to hell and, you know, and for him, it was something metaphysical. Um, just imagine what it's for people that are facing this virus that don't really have a concern for the afterlife and all that. It's the same sort of thing. So the idea is don't don't worry about the religion aspect of it because there's something in the Bible that says it's better for you to say that you're not and then later do than to say that you are and then later do not. Okay. So basically what that means is anybody who's religious and says anybody's going to hell, you're, if you're Christian and you say that, you're in the same camp as the Pharisees. And it said, Jesus said, it'll be better on the day of judgment for the, for the Sodomites than it will be for you, Pharisees. So basically all, everybody who's, who's like that. Another thing I could point out is that when Peter rose up his sword to cut off the ear of the Roman soldier, Jesus put the ear back on and told Peter, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword, which is basically to say war is futile. So Jesus was never for war either. And um, even in the Ten Commandments, it says, thou shalt not kill. And so war is really not something God wants people to be doing. He wants people to kind of basically being like martyrs. If, uh, gov if another government comes after us and threatens our freedom, we're to kind of be kind of lay back and just let it happen. And eventually they'll come to us and they'll realize that we're just like them and that they need to be treating us better. But nobody ever takes that stance. They always take war or something like that and war just never fixes anything. So, um, but anyhow, and the other thing is, is that when you put stress on each other and you got hierarchies and, you f and the news just bombards us with all sorts of things we need to be doing in this country, that we need to fix, um, we, we need to go and, and take care of certain sort of countries, you know, because they're getting a nuclear we weapons. The reason why some of those countries are getting nuclear weapons is because they're trying to protect, they're trying to get some level of negotiation with us and other countries to start talking about things that they need and, w and so that we can be positive. But, you know, they think they're crazies and they paint them as being crazies and then um, they won't respect us if we don't respect them. It's the same thing to say that um, people, that when America does not respect the environment, um, if we go to the table with any of these other big countries like India and now China's kind of out the window because of this whole ordeal, um, they're probably not going to want to like really consider us as really important because we're not taking into account the things they see as important. And so the environment, things like that matter to them and it should matter to us because it matters to them. If it doesn't matter to us, they don't have any reason to really negotiate the kinds of treatment that they want of the entire world and they will pretty much ignore us. And so if you think that there is MAGA, Make America Great Again, keep in mind that um, the corporations are always going to be favoring somebody in in the in the world and they will move to wherever the taxes are the best and the situation is the best for their corporation and they'll pay taxes there they won't pay them here in this country and now that we got this world epidemic it's all the way around the whole world can negotiate with the corporations the kind of treatment they want in their governments and they can also negotiate with the governments as well because um we have something that we're fearing but we can use this as a leverage point to leverage good things in the world. Okay, where did this all start? This started in wet markets. You know what wet markets are? They're basically like kinds of markets where um, somebody who's rich can go in and buy an animal from anywhere in the world. And so what they do is they basically have, it's like a crime syndicate or something. And they go and they go to places off on the edge of continents like South America and Africa and they pull in these animals into these little rooms and they're stressed and in just the way that we respond to stress the animals uh, respond to stress so they bring these animals in that are very stressed they're not in an environment they're familiar with they've been taken away from animals that they were familiar with um, uh, and 
on top of that, they're not getting the food they want, they're not getting in the temperature environment that they require to be comfortable, and they're being treated really badly, badly by the handlers, and um, they're, they're, they're fearing for their lives, I'm sure. And so what this does is their immune system turns off in the same way that our immune system turns off because we're in fear for our lives and all that higher order stuff doesn't matter whenever you, you just need the basic functions to run away, okay? So they're stressed. They're, they become like a petri dish for organisms. That's what we become when our immune system comes down. Their immune system come, comes down and it happens to them. So you get all of these diverse animals from all over the world from different countries and also know to people that travel the reason why they try to make sure that you don't have any certain kinds of diseases because certain um, certain countries in the world have certain disease that we don't want in America so we have to kind of um, we have to kind of make sure that they're that you're not coming in with a disease or that you're not you don't have any foods or something that might be carrying something that uh, we're afraid to get into the country so they have to control that stuff, but in this in this wet market, um, all this stuff is coming together in in these in these animals, and they're and they're stressed, and their immune system's offline. So their petri dish is for all sorts of organisms, and they're probably going to seize or do something like that, and the other animals are going to get it, and um, whichever organism is the most dangerous and to to all the organisms that organism is going to take over it's like evolution it's like you're evolving the best the, the best most dangerous uh, organism and that one's going to take over and all of everybody that comes in contact with those animals are going to take on that organism because all those animals are basically breeding the best most dangerous organism and so what this is really saying is even if this came from god what God is really saying is if you treat animals with cruelty, and in the Bible it says you, you're supposed to treat animals well, if you treat animals with cruelty, you can only expect to get cruelty back in some form. And so we're all getting, and it's, and it's for other reasons that we're going to get this payment back. If you think that it came from God, there's probably a reason for it. And it's the cruelty by which we're treating each other. It's not even biblical. Um, the slaves in the Bible were people who were enslaved by loans and things like that. So we're basically slaves to the people that we're indebted to. But according to the sabbatical year, supposedly, um, when the sabbatical year came around, you're supposed to let all your slaves go free. So we could probably put the stipulation on all loans that um, the person who had the loan had to pay it back within six years, and they'd have to guarantee according to their pay that they could pay back the loan. And it had to be six years was a limitation, and it could not be more than that. And so what it, because after six years, you have to be let go from the loan, okay? And that would be fair. That would be fair for the people providing the loan. That would be fair for the person paying off the loan. Um, but whenever you are given crazy um, credit, um, you know, credit interest rates or, or rates for taking money out, um, that that also should be limited. We shouldn't. They shouldn't be letting credit card companies do that. And when we're in this state right now, that the whole world is kind of in this tumult we're all feeling it we're all we have a chance to be united and to think of about a way of working together in this um we can't let the corporations take this as a new public relations thing they can push out to say that when the, we were all in this situation we relied on them to survive now we need to turn this around and we need to use this as a a, a wild card for which to leverage better um, payment um, or better better treatment and the corporations as as workers and we need to help recognize that it's us that is being putting ourselves in danger now I'm a Kroger employee but I will point out to Kroger if you want to fire me I'm fine with that but I'm gonna let you know that I'll go to the Union and I will start a new campaign and this is what my plan is going to be I'm going to use the fact that you're not giving us face masks in this current affair is kind of the canary in the coal mine that you really don't care about us. 
I could use other things like whenever you tell us that it's of our primary importance that our customers stand first. I could say you could go over to 7-Eleven and get a pizza, a full pizza for $7. Um, rather than buying one over here at Kroger, and then the upper management would say, wait one second, you want to sell our pizzas to those people? And I say, no, now we know what your ultimate uh, goal is, and that's selfishness. It's greed. It's not to treat your customers better, and you're also not treating your customers better in this current affair because you're not giving your front-end employees masks so that if they ever get the virus, they won't pass it on to the customers because what's the gestation period for this? It's like four days. So four days, we wouldn't even know we had the virus if we had the virus, and if we didn't have face masks, we would be spreading it to every customer down the way, and I would be willing to bet that if I get the virus, I will pass it on to 400 people in South Lake, Texas, and a good number of those guys are rich. And if they heard this, they would be pissed off, and they would be getting lawyers, and they would be litigating to you out the wazoo. And I'm saying to my own employees, I'm saying, we need to use this time to negotiate a new contract with Kroger to get better, better pay, uh, I'd say $12 an hour because that's living wage. If, you, if you're unsure about living wage, there's a website called livingwage.mit.edu. Go to livingwage.mit.edu and it will tell you for any state what the living wage is. It'll tell you for different family sizes and different configurations and it'll lay out what all the costs are so that you will know how that would be spent. And so... Um, if they say, well, you know, $12 is um, too much, and, you know, I'm not saying everybody in the, gut, in the, in the U.S., sh all companies should be paying people $12 an hour. I'm just saying Kroger should if they want to step up and be the person that they put in their public relations videos. Because otherwise, if they go up and they try to create some sort of video to say that they're good guys, I will go to the union and we will make a counterclaim to that and we'll throw it into the media and we'll have plenty of proof because you didn't give us face masks and you don't care about your customers. You're just greedy bastards like all the other corporations that are incorporated. They have a fiduciary responsibility to their creditors and their creditors are crying for more money and they're saying that customers don't matter, that these free Friday downloads don't matter because that's taking money away from them. And it says in the Bible that the root of all evil is is the love of money. And it says that for a reason. It also says um, uh, it'll, it'll be easier um, for a camel to enter through the eye of the needle than it will be for a rich man uh, to get to heaven. So what I'm saying is I'm saying that um, this is a perfect environment. It was probably put forth by God to kind of let us know how what we're doing wrong. And this stress that we're putting on each other is unnatural. And we shouldn't have it. Um, for the people, for the conservatives out there that believe in trickle-down economy, it's fairly easy. What you do is you put this in your mind. Which would you rather have? Um, save would you save time or save money saving the two at the same time is unnatural that you can't do that you either save time or you save money okay what would you do you would spend money to save time there you go so in this case we're dealing with this virus wouldn't it be better to spend money on people like clicklist and shipped and or even our even our well clicklist or shipped or um, instacart or any of those organizations, or uh, Uber Eats, or whoever. Um, throw money at them so that you can spend more time with your grandchildren rather than going across town. Anybody who has money and they have time and they go across town to um, they go across town to save money and, and time. Um, what does this say to their their children? What does this say to the um, the friends that they supposedly love, it says you're a cheapskate, that you only care about that stuff, you care about material things, you don't care about your family and the people around you. So what you need to do is you need to be spending time with your children, grandchildren, calling them on the phone in this, in this crisis, calling them on the phone, 
talking to them. If they like Minecraft, learn Minecraft, but don't learn it from a child because they're going to intimidate you. Find other adults, learn Minecraft, and if you really want to have a lot of fun with Minecraft, get in an Oculus Go. I've got a VR headset, and you can side uh, load the Go with Minecraft. I've got plenty of videos that show me show people that I've been doing this. I like Minecraft, and you're probably saying, well, why would an adult play Minecraft? The guy who created Minecraft, his name is, um, he goes by the name Notch. He's in his 30s. He sold Minecraft to, to Microsoft for $2 billion. Uh, he owns the biggest mansion in Hollywood. Um, he is rich. He's Swedish. He's part of the Swedish Mensa chapter. Um, the program, the game Minecraft, was originally programmed in Java. Ask any Java de developer, do you make video games in Java? And they will say no, because it's too friggin' slow. It's object-oriented. It's fairly perfect in the way that you can design things and make things really efficient. And he did that. He made a really efficient game that had artificial intelligence in it for all the monsters and the, and the chickens and the, the cows. And they, feel, you feel like they are alive, and um, and the chickens come up at you, and they look up at you, and they do things that chickens do, but they're very basic. There is no physics in the thing. Um, he took care of the problem of having cows and chickens being able to reproduce. He didn't put male and female chickens in there. He just put any kind of. It's each chicken looks the same. Each cow looks the same. And so when you give them, you give the chickens um, grass seed, uh, then they will reproduce. You give two chickens grass seed, they will reproduce. You give two cows um, grass, they will reproduce. You give, do it with sheep, you, they will reproduce. With pigs, I think you have to give them carrots or, or potatoes or something. They will reproduce. I don't know what it is for llamas. But um, the thing is, is that what Minecraft really is, is it's called a sandbox. It's not really a game. It's called a sandbox. And um, you could play games in it, but you can also do other things. And I think what it really is, is it's a meditative program. This would be something that if you were living alone and you didn't like solitaire because it was too simple, get into Minecraft and you will find there's a whole world in there that you can ba make and be a part of. And it will help you find a release from all the stress that you're feeling in your life and you can get that taken care of inside of Minecraft and Notch was really smart in the way he made Minecraft the worlds are procedurally generated um, if you're a mathematician then you understand that you can use um, closures and lambda functions all sorts of stuff to produce infinite worlds that use random number generators to determine what the probability is of certain sorts of things appearing certain places inside of the land. And so there's like monster uh, spawners in certain places, and there's diamond, and there's a certain probability you might find diamonds. And he uses all of that to, to create kind of this whole land that follows all these rules. It's all recursive and it's all procedurally generated. And the thing I think is true about Minecraft is it doesn't crash. And that probably is a result of the kind of programming he did, which was probably like Lisp. It was highly recursive. It doesn't have any any kind of side effects that you have in C where, um, where functions try to access the local scope of your variables and, and interact with global variables and create all sorts of havoc. He probably doesn't have that anywhere in his source code. And for that reason, it probably won't crash on you. Um, it might suck down a lot of resources, but it probably won't crash. And if it does crash, it'll be purely for semantic reasons. It won't have anything to do with the language itself. And so um, I've, um, I've got a computer science degree, so I know about that stuff. And I also know that when programmers go into the real world and they do programming, the corporations put so much pressure on them that um, it's like it had to be done yesterday, give it to me now. And when you do that to programmers, they don't get to use their education to make better programs. They have to do what's called coding at the terminal, and it's called a great way of creating really bad code. 
and then they come up with all these other principles of rapid prototyping to make things go faster. I mean, to try to put in the nice things inside of the software, but do it in an environment that's toxic, um, which is creating businesses. Part of the reason why I don't want to be a programmer, I'd rather be a bagger, because when I go home, I've got like a whole day that I'm not going to be called in and I can do whatever the heck I want to. And I, I, in my mind, it's going, would I rather make 4000 a month being a bagger or would I rather make 6000 a month or so being a programmer that's going to be called in on his days off to deal with problems with the database and, and various sorts of things that are in there? And it's possible that those things will never get fixed and that the corporations are going to keep, I mean, the companies are going to keep letting go of people and bringing people in and they're not going to comment their code because they're afraid if they lose their job and they comment the code then somebody will come in and be able to work on the code base and there's you see that's how you can create a really bad environment for creating good software and that's the reason why software always has bugs in it is because the people at the top just don't care enough for the programmers and the way that the programmers deal with solving problems in their own code it goes across the whole board. And I think that if we had one year off in the country, even if we got rid of this virus, um, what we need to use that time for is we need, need to socialize the entire healthcare system and socialize anything we can just for one year and then go back and give it back to private industry. And in that time, what we'll do is we'll establish all the kinds of systems that are necessary to be in place in order to create a free market. Um, for instance, in healthcare, there is a solution that they worked off on in Los Alamos called the Telemed Project. And the whole purpose of that was to create an integrated healthcare informatics system. And the guy I worked for was David Kilman, and he was pushing this through. Um, we had some people out in Michigan named Caridata, and they had developed the PIDs um, spec or they had worked on the the solution for the PID spec and what PIDs is is it's a way of identifying people based on traits but not any particular trait multiple different can, kinds of traits because different people need different kinds of traits if you're tracking Spanish people you come to realization that you can't use names to track Spanish people because they have a lot of the same last names there are other things you can use you can use blood type you can use retinal scans you can use fingerprint scans all of those things are not going to be 100% uh, matches. What you do is you use fuzzy logic to determine how much of a probability that the match is with the real person. And then if you use this in all of your record systems in all the, in all the clinics and all the hospitals, then you can, do, um, you can determine a match between a number of, of different patients that are the same patient and find all their healthcare records. And then we have a method by which to track a pandemic, such as this current virus that we're dealing with right now. So the way that you do that is you do peer-to-peer -peer correlation of the records based on those traits. You also use the same process to identify the doctors that need to have access to those records. And then you do um, stuff like credential checks, like what you do with um, secure business over the internet by permitting uh, by verifying whether or not the business on the other end is trustworthy because it would have um, a, it would have a certificate with a trusted entity like um, like um, oh I'm trying to remember their names Verisign and so like Verisign or somebody like that or or Thought um, the, there's a guy named um, his name is I'm trying to remember his name but he's a guy who started Ubuntu. And he owned Thought, and he sold it off. I think he sold it off to Verisign. But what it was, what he created was a certificate um, site that would offer certificates to businesses, and it, they would get in, 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 you know, with this they would be able to distribute their public keys, and then you could verify if the business on the other end is trust trustworthy, and then through that be able to develop a secure connection and a trusted connection so you could actually do business. That's the reason why people are even able to do business online is because of that. And so anyhow, 
Um, but we need to do that something like that in our healthcare institutions with the doctors. We need to verify that their credentials, that they got their credentials from various institutions. And we could probably use that as a way of vetting whether we can bring doctors into current institutions. Even if they have certificates that claim they came from certain institutions, we could verify if their credentials were correct by comparing it to a con comparing their identity, their their traits and stuff, to the traits that were in the various sorts of credential places, the various sorts of of, um, of universities and stuff they went to, and systems, and we could verify whether or not they were uh, re if they were really accredited or if they were. Um, say a psychopath that one of the things psychopaths do is they will fake credentials to get to higher places in an organization so if you have a better uh, PIDs if you have something like PIDs in place it'll make it very hard for somebody who is like a sociopath or a psychopath to get into places in an institution without um, having the necessary credentials okay and so we can pretty much fix a lot of our problems in our hierarchies by keeping the people out that will not really necessarily care about the processes through which people go through to verify uh, their legitimacy, okay? And so we need PIDs for that. And it's the PID spec is on the OMG, that's the object management group. Um, I think that was something that was started by um, Grady Booch, uh, who started uh, UML. And so I think he started the OMG. And the idea behind the OMG is to try to come up with a standard method by which um, systems can integrate in enterprise, uh, in various sorts of enterprises. And there was one specified for, for the healthcare industry. And that was spearheaded by the guy that I worked for, David Kilman, who was working in the Telemed project in Los Alamos. And so, um, it, but, the private industry came in and he said basically the private industry came in and and protested against the government and said this telemed project is competing with private industry and he said it was basically like these these shelf uh, software vendors that were using stuff like Excel and Microsoft package they really didn't have a solution and what they're working on within the government was a real solution to healthcare and informatics problems it wasn't and what they were working at Telemed really wasn't the software itself, but a method of integration and a, creating a kind of a system, an idea of how healthcare institutions need to integrate on an informatics well uh, level. And they had a lot of professionals come in and discuss this. And one that they worked on was PIDS, which is patient, which is person identification system. And it doesn't use a master patient ID. Most um, organizations, when they take on new organizations and they bring them in, they will give all. They'll take all the IDs of the various sorts of records, try to merge them together, and they put them to and they associate with them with a grand master pa uh, master ID, and that number is used to cor to relate all those records. But it is not based upon the attributes of the patient that help to recognize them. It's based upon the certain record relationships they find, and then they solidify them that way. Um, if we had better healthcare informatics system using PIDs, we could also trace people who go from doctor to doctor, faking their um, faking their ailments so that they can get drugs that they're that they're addicted to, and so we could get rid of that. And so we get rid of the abuse of drugs that shouldn't be put out for such reasons by tracing identity. Um, by doing correlation of identity, we can use artificial intelligence to try to recognize the high probability that certain records are the same guy. And um, this will also reduce the amount of cost on the patients because they'll go into the clinic and they won't have to fill out the forms that are sitting there interrogating them for all of the attributes of the things that um, that they need to get treated for, because the reason why the uh, why the doctor clinics are doing this is because they're trying to prevent malpractice, and they need to know about your history so that they can't so they know how to treat you, but also on the flip end of that to protect themselves from malpractice 
because if you lied about anything, then they would bring that up into a court case. Um, so, but to see, they could save time is that if there was an integrated healthcare and informatics system in place, then we could correlate all those records from all the institutions and we'd find your records and we could say, is this your record? Is that your record? Is that your record? And bring them all together. And when they need to treat you, um, you could uh, you could say it's okay for you to use my entire healthcare record from all the institutions that are available, and um, and they do bring it in and they could determine what your healthcare status is uh, overall, and then they wouldn't have to interrogate you for that information, and they could be protected from malpractice because all that information would be at their fingertips, and if anything was incorrect, they could go after the institution that put out the wrong information. See, so the the thing is, is that what's stored in the records and what's correlated is based upon uh, traits in you, and and it's collected from when where you go and have your health care done, and it wouldn't matter where you went, um, they could accept you instantly, and you wouldn't have to fill out those forms for an hour before you're seen. Also, keep in mind, this is another thing. I'm going to go off and uh, veer off to a second to the side, and I'll come back. Um, doctors, um, the insurance companies, the, basically what H happened with HMOs is that they would only pay the doctor for a certain amount of money for them to treat patients. And the doctors demand more money because they've got to hold up their clinic and things. So what do they do? They call everybody to come in at a certain time and what they do is they put all the patients to fill a bunch of rooms and the doctor will go around and see each patient for like 10 minutes and then they can collect like an hour with each one of those patients from the insurance companies and will pay them for 10 minutes and that's the reason why the doctors have to do that and that's the reason why you sit around in those rooms waiting for the doctor to come around to you is because they're seeing everybody for 10 minutes and the insurance company is only going to pay them for 10 minutes and they're not going to pay them for an hour. And so that's another thing. The other thing is, is the doctors need to have a certain amount of um, credit each year. They have to go out and get, um, and to get experience uh, to keep up their, their license. It's called CME credits. They have to go out and get that. And how I know about that is because I worked for a company called Ferguson Lynch that worked um, on creating the websites for the Hepatitis B and C Foundation. Another thing is, is that they were paying me on, um, they are paying me in kind, and what that meant is that meant that um, I was going to get paid probably gift, like a 4000 per year, and then they wouldn't be able to claim me on, the, their, they wouldn't have to claim me on their taxes. So I didn't have to really be an employee. And the reason why they had to do that is because they had to take the lowest, um, the lowest, um, the, the lowest rung on when p the proposals went out. They could put a proposal on, and they could undercut everybody. So they undercut everybody. And the guy, the lady I was working with, was a really good person, but she was trying to bring us on so that we could be involved professionally in something, but to undercut the competition and create. Um, web software and things and it and for me it was a learning experience because I got to see what doctors in the field were having to do in order to get their credit and um, the things that mattered to them and things that didn't matter for instance it doesn't really matter that the doctor um, is is going to answer the questions correctly at the end of the test they want to make sure that they understand what they're going to learn is correct so they have the proper experience and they can bring that with them into the, their office whenever they see patients and they want to see relevant stuff and they want to see good you know good information things that are going to be going to better them and they want to have that time but because the way the insurance companies tax them um or, or tax prevent them from getting their money they they have some of them have to just not accept insurance um, in order to survive some of them uh, and so the thing is is that and also and on the flip side of this what's happening in healthcare informatics they'll get a database system and the guys that and the guys that are selling them the database system will say like a year down the road um, we're not going to accept the same amount that we we charged you the previous year this year you're going to pay a little bit more 
and then they'll keep nickel and diming the doctors and they'll finally just give in, they'll buy a different database system and then they'll print up all of the all of the stuff that they had from that one database system and they'll have some of their staff go in and rekey that data into the other database system, you see, because the because the formats are incompatible. This is how Microsoft makes money, by the way, is by keeping formats incompatible. So you're forced to buy the new program, the new version of Word, because in order to put in your proposal into the government, you have to have the same file format that they're using in the government. Otherwise, they won't be able to see your document in the correct way. And so they use that to leverage people to keep repurchasing Microsoft software. And so this is the reason why I don't see Bill Gates as a good guy. I see him as a kind of an evil guy, and I have all my life um, because he does this and his company does this. And the guy I see as the biggest hero in all this is a guy by the name of Richard Stallman. Look him up. Look up. Um, look up Tun Rosendahl. I've been in contact with him. He created Blender 3D. Um, look at Linus Torvalds, even though his name was put on Linux, he really had very little to do with that whole operating system. Richard Stallman had lots more to do with it than he did. And Richard Stallman started this whole thing in the 70s because he was treated unfairly by commercial software whenever CPUs became so cheap that anybody could afford them. That's the reason why Bill Gates is on the opposite issue of him because Bill Gates is trying to stick up for people, programmers that are now going to have to try to make money selling on microprocessors rather than on mainframes, where when a company would buy a mainframe computer, they would hire the, comp the programmers just off the, you know, just for the sake that they had this big expensive computer, they needed programmers to maintain the sources. That's where Richard Stallman was kind of, he was in that environment with the Unix operating system, but then Bell Labs decided because they were looking at the microchips coming out that they were going to have to change their business model and they couldn't just offer um, maybe the user, university a license. They were going to have to go off and and um, sell it as a product and then to pay their off their programmers. But Richard Stallman didn't like that because um, the way they had it set up is that he was getting access to all the source code and that he could develop that, but then they took it out of his hands. He said, no more, I'm not gonna put up this anymore. And then he turned around and he created the, um, he created something that was called GNU, which stands for GNU is not Unix, it's a recursive acronym. Um, they also got one called Wine, which is Wine is not an emulator. And Wine is actually an implementation of the Windows API and it can be used to um, it can be used to run Windows applications on top of Linux, and it does it uh, legally. Uh, there's no way that Microsoft can ever put them in court or litigate towards them because um, it's completely legitimate what they're doing. They're basically implementing the a the applications programmer interface between the application and the operating system, and in the in behind the API, it's Linux rather than Windows so that the Windows programs can interact with Linux as if they were interacting with Windows. And what that says is basically there's no difference between Linux and Windows, just the API calls. And after a while, Wine will have implemented all the various API call calls that Windows has, and no matter what Microsoft does to change their API, Wine will be able to implement it, and eventually will be able to run all Windows applications on Linux. It's in the best interest of, the, of Windows developers to develop for Wine rather than for Microsoft Windows, so that when their applications are used, they will run in both context rather than just on the Windows platform and then they could use Wine to negotiate better interfaces with Microsoft so that Microsoft couldn't re uh, couldn't force a repurchase of Windows and force them to learn training and all the things that Microsoft makes money on with every change of their software see Microsoft 
keeps changing the software whether it needs to or not. That's their business model. They make money on the change of file formats and on the change of interfaces. This is all the reason, also the reason why I believe they went with XML and they were not really interested in creating object-oriented interfaces like Corba was doing, is to avoid um, making it really easy to identify the interface and to remain compliant. Um, you see, if you can de define an interface clearly using just func method calls, then you know that that is the minimum requirement and anything on top of that is um, extra. It's not part of the standard. So um, with Microsoft, uh, X, the way XML works is that tags that are not part of the standard are extra stuff. But then if they go off in a different direction, they could probably they could probably hijack the whole standard by adding things in there that don't belong for the sole purpose of being able to resell something. That might be the reason why Java is no hat, deprecates parts of its interfaces, probably to leverage another application or, or, or another computer or whatever, um, that it doesn't really make any sense to deprecate interfaces. Um, you should be able to keep all of the existing software that exists, and it's they always make it a support issue, but you can also use support issue as an issue to make people buy new packages. They'll say, well, we'll support that old interface, and we'll support all these new interfaces, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to encourage people to jump off that old platform um, even though there are a lot of people still dependent on it, they're forcing all of the programmers to refactor their code, which is unnecessary. If you got something working, why, why? I mean, this is a conservative stance, and these guys might be conservatives, but the conservative stance is if it's not screwed up, why screw with it? I mean, if it works, why screw up? Screw it, screw with it. And the reason why the companies do it is just because they're trying to make money. They're, they're interested in making money, they're not interested in innovating. So they don't innovate, they just keep remaking interfaces and stuff like that. Now I know I went off on a whole tangent there to go and talk about that, but um, I'll come back to the Telemed project. Um, PITS, Patient Identification Service. Uh, RADS, um, that is for, that's for determining, determining um, uh, access to databases. So that's all about um, determining security. RADS is about that, and that's also in the specification of the OMG. LQS, that's to determine how to translate the coding of the, of the healthcare, not the insurance, coding of the healthcare between various sorts of countries. Like if you transfer a record from America to France, their, um, their procedures are gonna be different in France and they're, the way they specify the certain kinds of ailments are gonna be different. So you need to have a system in place to do the translation, and that's what LQS is about. Um, so there was RADS, PIDS, LQS, and then there's something called COAS, and that is about the, about the handling of the patient records and the recording of the information of the patient records inside of a database and how you're to handle that information. And you can use all those things together. And I think there's another specification for how to handle security. The one problem with CORBA that, uh, that, um, um, that um, uh, David Kilman told me is that um, because CORBA chooses a different chooses a different port on every single access, um, that it's really hard to do secure sockets with it. And so, I mean, that was just, the reason why I did that, I think, was because what he said is that Corva was designed to be work, to work with parallel processing. It, it was designed to be very efficient. It's much more efficient than XML is. Uh, and the reason why is because it works with binary data on a very low level. It doesn't work with text. And uh, you could take something possibly from Corba and turn it into XML so you could make it integrate with something that was less, um, uh, something that was less low level. Um, but the thing about Corba is it's very efficient. And um, the way these specifications were made uh, was to send information in little pieces, only what you need, not the whole 
not the whole record like HL7 would do. Um, the just not like just the ID nines. I mean, it you could ask for specific sets of information. It would just send that stuff across, and that could be very fast. It could be very secure, and it could be uh, matched with authorization checks and credential checks to make sure it's secure. Uh, make sure that it's authorized. That the person who's getting access to it should be somebody who should get access to it. They have ways in RADS to specify temporary access. For doctors who might be visiting a clinic and that day they need to have special access to records, they could offer a temporary license, a temporary credential, so that they could do that that day, and then it would later, um, it would later, um, uh, it would it would later um, relinquish itself. I'm, I'm trying to, it would have a, um, it would have an expiration. So it, would, it wouldn't work past the same day. And then later on, they couldn't use that credential to have access to the records when they were outside of the institution that they were accessing the records from. So um, RADS handles all that stuff and they thought through all that stuff, but it was really just an, an interface specification the same way that TCP IP is an interface specification for doing stuff over the internet. Um, CORB is based on a uh, reason why a lot of people don't think CORB is great is because it's based on um, um, remote procedure calls, RPC. Um, and uh, so, but but underneath it all, it's re remote procedures calls, but it's also language independent. You can use it with C, C++, Python, Lisp, pretty much anything you want to use. And so it levels the playing field, it creates fair trade, it forces companies to be compliant. It doesn't let any company get a leg up on any other company because they all have to be compliant with the specification. So it's what they do behind the scenes is their business, but it's if, if, if they don't integrate with the CORBA specification, then, um, then they're not, they're not going to be in the market. Nobody's going to take them in the market because the doctors would have, the government would have to specify that you had to implement these CORBA standards in order for your applications to be used in the healthcare institutions. And if you do that, then there can't be any leveraging of file formats and things that Microsoft would do that any other software company would do to create mod monopolies, uh, data monopolies inside of the inside of the healthcare institutions. And what David Kilman would tell people that we'd be talking to is that in the financial um, industry, in the, in the banks and whatnot, there's better integration in there and, um, and integration in the healthcare industry in healthcare informatics inside of healthcare institutions is in the dark ages because the government won't go in there and make sure that it works. And that, since we have this epidemic going on, it will give the government certain abilities to go in there and make sure that all of this works this way so that when we come back online, all the companies are are integrating properly and and are not doing any of this um, data monopoly creating these data monopolies inside of the institutions and when the institutions need software they don't have to be uh, given this well we're not going to permit you to have this software because they'll be able to translate all their data over to a competitor's database really easily so they can get better consumer um, treatment okay and the, the the companies that shouldn't be in the market of creating healthcare informatics software will demit they will disappear which is what you want in a free trade a free trade co economy what you want in fair trade is you want to have it such that companies that are not that shouldn't be there just disappear because they can't keep up with with what's necessary to be compliant okay and so we need to have that in place and that is only going to come about if we socialize the healthcare institutions. I'm not talking about long-term socialization. I'm talking about short-term so that the government can come in there with people like the guys that are working on telemed and coming up with a way of integrating the systems to the specifications of what the healthcare people need, what the doctors need, 
and get everybody on the table and make sure that it works well and then pass that spe spec along to people in the rest of the world like in France and Germany and Russia and wherever they need to do healthcare. And when our guys go overseas, when everybody, somebody goes overseas, uh, a Russian doctor, they can give them a specification. Uh, the, doc, the patient can give a special code um, from their cell phone or something that will permit the Russian doctor to have temporary access to their healthcare record so that doctor can treat them adequately rather than having to wait for the Americans to fax your records to that doctor and then having him to do the the uh, translation of all the codes because he does, he's not familiar with how the healthcare is treated in America. It's going to be different in his area. So they need to deal with all of the all the various sorts of specific um, ways of, of defining what the procedure was so they'll be on the right page. And we need to have that stuff in place. And the only way that's going to happen is if it happens here first, because we've already done work on it. I'm sure the other countries have also done our work on it. We need to integrate with them too. So that next time we have an outbreak, we can track the pandemic on a very low level. We don't have to call all the institutions. We can see whenever certain areas of the map are not are not complying, and we can go out there and see what their problem is instantaneously. It is like we'd be able to see a real time um, a real time update of what's going on. The thing with this tracking of pandemics is that we don't have to know um, the the identity of the patients when tracking a pandemic. All we have to do is look for the necessary things that we need to see in the healthcare record if things were updated and if they had the test taken and see where there are and if we can see a number of people that are in an area that are all showing positive then we know where to quarantine so that we can control the virus from getting to the rest of the world and um, we also need to be able to see if there's anything that looks kind of strange in people's healthcare records to track new pandemics that aren't even on the on the um, even on the the radar yet and that's because we need that place but we don't have it I'm pretty sure we don't have it and the canary in the coal mine is if you have to go into a doctor's clinic and fill out a set of information there's no integrated healthcare informatics system and we need to deal with that it's not it's not healthcare insurance that is the problem that the HIPAA is really just in place to try to protect your healthcare information from the insurance companies so that they can't charge you for stuff that um, that that you had in that you know so they they can't know about the situation of your healthcare because if they did they would be able to charge you premiums and 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 um, and uh, not pay for certain certain procedures because they shouldn't know that stuff. They should only know the basic procedure. They shouldn't know the intricacies, uh, like if you're facing cancer or things like that. They shouldn't know that stuff. They should only know about the, 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 the procedures, the treatment that was given, not what, what is going on with you. And, and it's in the best interest of every politician and everybody that's holding some social place in the hierarchy, some sort of spot, to not let their records get out as well because that's going to determine um, if they get elected the next year. If they have HIV and it shows that they have a history of becoming infected with women and they, they've got some like really kind of alternative lifestyle going on, um, they don't need to have that accessible to insurance companies. That's probably part of the reason why HIPAA came about. Now, another part of HIPAA that's not being addressed is for a healthcare informatics system like the one I've talked about. And there's a stipulation in there is that it be very secure if there was ever a digital informatics system that would work like that, where they would be passing records over the internet on unsecured networks. And there's ways of doing that as the way I was specifying with this specification. And the thing is, is I'm not, I haven't been in the healthcare industry for a while, but I'm just saying that if they don't have anything to the up to snuff to what they were working on the telemed project in Los Alamos, 
then they don't have a solution and we need to socialize the whole system just for a year, not forever, just for a year so that we can go in there and fix anything that needs fixing. Um, so that when things come back online with the private industry, that they're all competing nicely and that there is no monopoly, data monopolies. You know, you can have, you can, you can avoid business monopolies, but data monopolies are different sort. A data monopoly is whenever you've got a format of an interface um, that's, that's proprietary or you've got a format of data that's proprietary or they're somehow making it in such a way that nobody can, can use their data format or something. Um, those are things we don't want in our government. We don't want in our healthcare institutions. We don't want it anywhere in America because if they do that kind of thing, then, then somebody in some software company is going to be able to use those formats and those, and those language, um, those special little things they add to the language while deprecating other parts of the interface um, to leverage uh, consumers into buying software they don't need because the old software worked. And so the thing is, is they need to keep old pieces of software. Even if they're not going to support them, they need to keep the stuff around. They can't just pull the licensing from it. And keep in mind, those guys that um, at Alias Wavefront, you pissed me off. Um, I, I used Wavefront software to make some animations way back uh, in the mid-90s, and I made Rise of the Thorax, and I think it tried, it. somebody at SGI told me it helps sell Wavefront software. And when I, I think it was Alias, I think it was the management of Alias that did this, they went in and they decided to pull all licensing from Wavefront users. And if anybody who had learned Wavefront, which I did, um, wanted to buy the software, we couldn't because they wouldn't offer us new licenses. So I said, screw that. I will pick up the first open source package or freeware package and push it with all my might. I did that for five years with Blender. And now if you feel like Blender has a leg up on you and, it, and you know you could have avoided it, um, yes, you could have. You could have treated guys like me a little bit better. And because you didn't treat me better, I am now staring you in the face. And um, AutoCAD owns you. And you're about 100, according to an uh, interview that Tun did with uh, Blender Guru. Um, he revealed that he knew that the SAC filings for AutoCAD showed that... Um, that um, their ownership of 3D Studio Max and Maya accounted for about $100 million of revenue per year. And he deduced from that that Maya had about 15,000 licenses. And so the reason why he got 15,000 